Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, everyone. The long-awaited return into the book of Ephesians. I know you guys were just waiting to get back into it. Who, who remembered that we were going through the book of Ephesians before we took a little break? You guys, you guys remember that? Okay, maybe because I reminded you last, uh, last time I, I spoke. Uh, but we're going to get back into the study of Ephesians, a refresher for those who might need it. The book of Ephesians is a letter or an epistle written by the Apostle Paul to the believers in Ephesus. The Christians there, in terms of the context of the time, were surrounded by a worldly culture that glorified earthly success, power, pleasure, and was rampant with idolatry. So the letter to the Ephesians was written with a purpose to encourage Christians to live in such a way that was radically different from the world and the culture around them. Why? Because as we've said so many times, For those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are now connected with Christ in relationship with him and also within the community of God. So we're connected to Jesus, our relationship with him, but we're also connected to one another. And so we have a purpose, a call in our lives to live vastly, radically different than the world. Remember in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, that Paul was telling the believers that they must walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So not walk in a way that's worthy so that you can be called, so that you can become a believer, but walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've already received as a child of God. So context is important, and so we're going to get into the passage here in Ephesians chapter 5 that talks about husband and wife. But there's kind of three blocks that are talked about here, husband and wife relationship, parents and children relationship, and bond servants and master relationship. We're going to get to those other two next time, but today we're going to concentrate on husband and wife. And so Paul is speaking into the different household relationships that you would find in Ephesus, in the Greco-Roman society. So Paul's teaching that God's family, God's people... In God's community, his people, everyone is equally loved and valued in the eyes of God. Where the world often operates under a power structure of dominance and you know, putting people down and raising others up, the people of God were called to submit, actually, to one another. Why? Out of the reverence for God. Christ. And that's what it said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, which is the verse right before the verses that we're going to get into together today, that we ought to submit to one another in the people of God out of reverence for Christ. So what does that mean? Relationship with Jesus is affecting the outward relationships that we have around us. So I know that, you know, today's subject, it can be kind of a touchy subject at times, but I hope that whether you are married or not, that the principles we see come out of this passage will be an encouragement to you, will be a, a challenge to you as you see God's awesome love and design for marriage, particularly husband and wife. What is that supposed to look like to have a healthy family, to have a healthy relationship between husband and wife? The verses we're going to look at are in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 22 through 33 together. This is the word of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church." because we are members of his 
body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give to us your word and the timeless principles that we find in your word for humanity, for every relationship that we could think of. We thank you, God, that you give to us your wisdom, your way. So God, I pray that you would humble our hearts to hear your word, that even if we have preconceived notions and thoughts about what a healthy husband and wife relationship looks like, that as your word is being preached, God, that you would break down any walls that there might be, areas where we need to grow as husbands, as wives, in a way that glorifies you. Because our relationship with you, our commitment to you, your love for us, your grace for us, it means that there is an application of that love and relationship in our lives. And so we thank you that you have designed marriage. We thank you that you have brought many people, men and women together to be husband and wife, and that through that relationship, there's something special and unique that you do through it to help your people grow, not only to know one another more, but also to know you more deeply. So God, we pray that this message would truly sink into our hearts and minds and that we would take time to think on it, reflect on it, and that ultimately we'd find your grace for all the ways in which we fall short and fail, but also your love that compels us then to share that love with our husbands, with our wives, with all those around us. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you know, I, uh, last week on Sunday, I, I was... In New Jersey, I was officiating a wedding uh, there, <clears throat> and the bride was a girl that was in high school when I first met her. I was her youth pastor in New Jersey, and so it really is crazy how time flies. Um, I still feel the same in my heart, in my mind, but seeing young children grow reminds me that I'm indeed getting older, so even from youth group to getting married and going through different life phases. And even here at our church, seeing those who were tiny little kids when I first got here six years ago, and now in high school, teenagers growing up, it's wild how quickly time flies by. Before I officiate any wedding, I have the couple do premarital counseling with me, and over the several sessions that we have together, we talk about the biblical foundation of marriage, and we also talk about a lot of different, you know, topics, and we're not going to cover those today, but from finances to conflict resolution to sex to love languages to all sorts of things that you deal with in marriage, but all of it is with the hope to provide resources to equip the soon-to-be husband and wife so that they could have a healthy marriage. And I'll say it again, as I always say to the couples, that the most important relationship that two people can have is not the relationship that they have, even as deep and intimate as it is, as husband and wife is. The most important relationship is not that one, but is indeed the relationship that each of them have with Jesus Christ. The one they have with God is no matter what relationships, but even in the husband and wife relationship, the closest relationship that you can have on earth, the relationship with God is by far the most important. So I say if you're growing in your walk with the Lord, in your faith in Jesus, then I promise you the way that you love your wife, the way that you love your husband and respect and honor him, those things really go hand in hand. And maybe you've heard of this kind of model where you see husband and wife, they're here together, and sometimes you just think they just have to grow closer together, right? So there's this kind of horizontal, you and me, that's it. You know, that's sometimes how people feel when they're getting married. It's like, it's all about us. And yet God says, I'm the one who designed marriage. And if you are my people, actually God is here at the center, and as two people are here growing 
towards their love for God and their relationship with Jesus, they grow closer and closer in a way to God and to one another. In an, it's just a profound thing, an awesome and amazing thing as you live out your life and experience that together. So yes, a healthy marriage means one with Christ at the center. That though no marriage is perfect, no husband and wife relationship is perfect, that if you are growing in your relationship with Jesus, if each person is taking their own faith and then together growing in that, then your bonds of commitment, the ones you have to Christ, will only strengthen the bond and the vows and the commitments that you make to one another. And so that's what today's message entails. From the verses we've read, there is a unique <clears throat> relationship that God gives to husband and wife, one that is like no other. Now, I just want to make a point here that this does not mean that if you aren't married or don't ever marry, that you are lesser in God's community. That's not what God says. Remember, God views every single person with absolute love and care and value. But he loves his people. And he has a plan for each and every individual. We all are in his hands for those of us who are in Christ. Amen? And so for every relationship, God gives his word to encourage us to live it out our faith. So there's three points that I'm going to have for us today. First is this, unique submission. Unique submission. Secondly is this, unique love. Unique Love, and the last thing is unique design. Unique design. So let's start with unique submission. Verse 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay. Who already feels a little bit uncomfortable? I think sometimes when we hear the word submission, too quickly our minds and hearts go to the idea of a power structure or as something that elevates one of value and brings another lesser. But that is not the definition that is being used here when it talks about the submission of wives to their husbands. Why? Because look how it talks about, it says, as to the Lord. It's saying there's a relationship that's here that God has uniquely given to husbands and wives. So when it says, wives submit to your husbands, we do so, wives do so with their relationship with the Lord in mind. But just to make sure that you know that, yes, husband and wife are equal, male and female are equal, we're going to look at a couple of verses from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So there is a value, a worth given to every human being, male and female. Male is not put above Female is not put below, man and woman equal in the eyes of God, both equally valuable, made in his image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the ground. So we see again that God gives the task of subduing the earth and procreating to both man and woman. So God is continually from the very beginning affirming the equal value of man and woman. One is not superior, one is not inferior. But what we'll see in today's passage is that though equal, there are different strengths, there are different weaknesses, there are different ways that the two complement one another, and there are ways where there are differences in the roles that are played within a healthy biblical marriage. Now, the word role also sometimes gets a very negative connotation. Who here has ever heard someone say, know your role? Right, we've heard that before. It's not a good thing when you hear those words. It's usually someone trying to put someone in their place. But in a biblical framework, to know your role is actually a great thing. 
because it's one that can help there to be harmony and growth, especially in this relationship, this unique relationship between husband and wife. So this is submission that is a unique submission. I'm going to read it again. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So this unique submission is one that takes place between wife to her husband. But notice again, real quickly, that it doesn't say women submit to all men. It doesn't say that anywhere. This particularly is speaking to the people of God. When you get married, it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. And so again, that affirms that this is not saying all women are under all men or anything like that, but there's a unique submission that should take place when a husband and wife come before God are united together in marriage. It says, wives in marriage with your husband, submit to him as to the Lord. So God does give authority as head or leader of the household or family, but this is not the type of authority that one lords over the other. It's not about someone having more power or more worth or more value, because with that authority, that role actually comes responsibility. And Paul likens it to Jesus Christ being the head of the church. Now, a man cannot save his wife. Only Jesus Christ can save. But it's in the idea that within this relationship, there is a submission and honor and a respect for the husband. But with that, we're going to get to it in the next point. Husbands also have a great responsibility as one who is to lead and to serve the family well. Submission of wives to husbands shows a humility before God in relationship with him. So why is Paul writing this to the Ephesians? What's happening in Ephesus at that time? So here he was actually speaking speaking into a particular context, but the principles still outweigh the test of culture and time. But wealthy women of high status were being educated and employed, and some even gaining government positions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that at all. We already talked in Genesis that there's a call to do work and to take care of the world in different ways as man and woman. But what was happening in Ephesus is that as women gained status, they began to no longer live in a family way where they were showing honor and respect to their husbands. Rather, actually, there were many things going on that were destructive to the families. Often, they would look down on their husbands. They would partake in extramarital affairs and live in an unmodest way. And so Paul, as he writes to the Ephesian church does not want Christian women to get so sucked into the culture around them that they would fall into this type of culture. Again, it's not about working or being successful, but if it's about a heart that stops respecting and honoring their husbands. And so God has uniquely brought a wife together in marriage with her husband. And this unique submission of the wife to the husband, it is a part of how God has designed and prescribed the relationship to be. Now, this might look very different in every marriage, but it's about how it's lived out in the heart of the relationship. So wives who are here, you can look at your husband and just in a weird way or in a strange way, yes, that is the man that God has given to you in your life to submit to in this unique submission and to to respect and to honor. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? But we trust God. So wives, as you trust the Lord, then, then out of that trust and knowing what Christ has done for you, then you can submit then to your husbands. And that doesn't mean that you do everything that they say and they just have absolute control and you can never get what you want, you never get a word. And no, that's not what we're talking about here. It's about a unique submission that pictures Christ and the church. So men, if you ever say or think that now that you've read these verses, you say, see, submit to me because you are the wife. And look, it says, wives, submit to your husbands. Ephesians 5, you heard it. If you ever use those words or think those words in your heart, 
in some type of argument or decision making, you have missed the point completely. Again, submission doesn't mean a right for husbands to belittle or condescend or to dominate a relationship with their wife, and never is it ever used as an excuse for some type of abuse. But it's meant as a grace that God has given to you as husbands to depend on Christ as you lead in the marriage. And we're talking about it. Make it easier on your wives to submit. Like, the more that you love your wife and show them who you are as a man of God, I promise you, it's going to make it easier for them to say, okay, I can, I can trust you, I can follow you. But women, wives, respect your husbands. Not because you deem them worthy of respect. Because there's going to be times where your husband may not seem very respectable and you don't feel like respecting them. But because of Christ, what he calls you to, may you honor them, right? May you respect them. May you submit to them. And I think that's important, this connection between respect and submission. In verse 33, I'm going to just jump forward a little bit, um, but it says, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So you see, there's this choice in submission to respect your husband. Even if you don't feel like he deserves it, you show it because of your love and honor for Christ. You know, I've heard it said that, you know, the way that you treat, a wife treats his, her, her husband affects how that husband will act. And there's this kind of dichotomy of the fool and the king, right? And so if a wife is always talking to her husband like he's a fool, then the fool is what will come out. But even if they are foolish, <clears throat> you treat them like a king in the way that you would love and honor and respect them, then out of that will come who he was made to be. You help draw out the man of God in them. Does that make sense? So we don't give because we've received. We give because we have received everything, everything we need from Christ. Amen? 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 Take it in, right? Okay, unique love is the second point. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. <clears throat> excuse me, that she might be holy and without blemish. I think before we move on to that, just I do think that we have to talk about the idea of, of respect and submission. Just, just one more thing to think about. If a man feels disrespected at home or doesn't feel like he receives respect from his wife at home, I promise you that he will look elsewhere to find that sense and feeling of respect. That's why you see in some married couples a man who loves to be at work and he's always putting all the time in. Well, maybe he's recognized there for the work that he's doing and receiving accolades and the honor from the people around them. But when they get home, they're grumpy, they're, they're bitter, and, and you don't know what's happening. And, and it's no excuse for men to behave, but there is something about men and feeling respect. From, especially from their wives, as it's meant to be. And so giving them the respect, submission, and the way that God has made everything to be, it really does, I mean, it, it makes sense. There's a unique submission that takes place, a humility that can only come from knowing God. Because in the world it says, oh, you're going to earn respect. You don't just get my respect. You're going to earn it, right? That's kind of what the world teaches. And then God says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay? Husbands, men, that's not an excuse to go looking elsewhere when you're in a married relationship to feel the respect and honor. You got to talk with your wives. You got to share that you haven't been feeling respect at home. 
You've got to have real conversations between you two so that you can grow in your marriage. But women, wives, this is a real thing. And I've seen this very thing split apart marriages. Okay, unique love. So husbands, it doesn't tell you to submit to your wives, but with the role that God has given to you as the head, the first thing that the word of God says to do in this relationship is love your wife. And this is a unique love because in culture, there is a type of transactional expectation when it comes to love. You love me, and I'll love you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You do for me, I do for you. It's always okay, tit for tat, right? But that is not how the love of Christ is. This is a unique love that Jesus Christ himself showed upon the cross as he bled and died for those who would believe in him, who become his bride, become the church. So Jesus died for the church. Jesus died for us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us and showed us love. That is the love with which you must love your wives. You hear that, men? You're called to love and serve your wife to the point of sacrificing your own life. Are you willing to lay down your life for your wife? A husband must prioritize his wife first and foremost above every other relationship outside of the one that he has with God. That means he puts her first over his parents, over his best friends of I don't care how many years. No, your wife is the important one. She is the one that is your priority. Love your wife. That's the first thing that happens. Sacrificial love, the love of Christ. Verse 26 to 27 is a little bit more difficult because it kind of comes out of nowhere. It talks about that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. But these words mirror the words in Ezekiel chapter 16 that talks about the people of God as being the bride of God. And what that ultimately means is that if they are being prepared for God as the groom, there is a building up and becoming of what she was always meant to be what God created her to be. So what a blessing and a challenge that as husbands, and yes, as wives, there is a mutual growing, but you can help your bride to become the woman of God that God always made for her to be. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? So you can be part of the building up of your wife, or you can be part of the tearing down of your wife, but as a Christian man, a man of God, you better be loving your wife cherishing her, prioritizing her, and showing her the love of God. Amen? And it keeps going. Verse 28 to 30. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Look, Let's be honest, men, right? When we want to eat something, we go and eat it. We don't even think twice. We, we know how to love ourselves very well. But when you become one flesh with your wife, it's no longer all about you. All the bachelors out here, right? You're used to living on your own, doing what you want, on your own timing, whenever you feel like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you commit yourself to a woman and you are now married to your wife, your priority is no longer yourself because yourself doesn't even exist. It's you and your wife. She becomes your priority. You look for ways to nourish her. You look for ways to cherish her and let her know that she is loved in that relationship. I'm sure many of us have heard of love languages, but one of the ways in which you can love your wife well is to find out what drives her, what actually makes her feel loved. You know how many times I've talked to husbands that say, I do all these things for her, and she's still not happy. And I said, well, you're showing her love in the way that you want to show her love, but have you ever taken the time to see how she feels loved? You're doing all kinds of things, but are you showing her love in the way that she receives it? 
And they talk about it kind of like a frequency, right? Like, I'm like putting out a frequency of love, but every single person has a different frequency receptor. And so you might be throwing out frequency and waves of love, like, I'm just loving her so well, but she might be on a different station. And so she's wondering why her husband doesn't love her, why she doesn't feel loved. You have to choose to commit to loving your wife. Cherishing her means knowing her, taking time to know what moves her. You could be buying her a thousand different extravagant gifts, but if your wife feels loved with quality time, she may appreciate the gifts, but they aren't gonna mean anything to her in terms of feeling loved as much as you just sitting down one day, setting aside time, putting your phone away, turning the football off, and just looking into her eyes and spending time talking with one another. Talking about your marriage, talking about your hopes, talking about your dreams, your, your fears, uh, maybe ways in which both people have been falling short and just open and honest communication as husband and wife. And husbands, men, let down your pride. If your wife says to you or is communicating to you, I haven't felt very loved, don't get defensive and prideful and say, well, look at all the things I'm doing for you. What more should I do to make you feel loved? Instead, take a moment and say, I'm sorry, honey. What are some things that I can do to let you know how much I love you? Because I do love you so much. You see, every time that there is a, a conflict in that kind of way is an opportunity for you as husbands to either reaffirm the love and the vows and the commitment you have to your wife, or it's a chance to get prideful and defensive and make it about you proving that you've been a good husband. And I'll tell you right now, one works and the other doesn't. So humble yourself. That's the only way you're gonna live a life with sacrificial love, is to remember the love of Christ for you. It means seeing what she wants more than what you want. And that's a hard thing to truly put someone else above yourself. But God calls you men, love your wives as Christ does the church. It's the deepest love that you can have. Your disposition, husbands, is always towards serving her and loving her well. And if you do this well, and if you show her God's sacrificial and gracious love, and you take time to cherish her, her submission to you and respect for you will grow because she can trust that you have her best interest at heart, that you have the love of God in you. Husbands, love your wives. Amen? All the husbands, I better hear a strong amen. Amen? amen. And men, if you ever become husbands, by God's grace, you too will love your wife. Amen? Amen? All the young men right here. Lastly, unique design. Verse 31 to 33. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you, here it is, love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So marriage is an amazing thing. God is so good. Man, when I hear people say, like, oh, like husbands talking about their wives as an old ball and chain, have you ever heard of stuff like that? Um, there's some just terrible idioms and things when people think about marriage and talk about marriage. Is marriage easy? No. Two selfish human beings trying to be selfless, trying to put someone above themselves, is not easy. There's work to be done. People have had trauma their whole lives, all kinds of things that have happened to them that they've experienced. And when you get into a marriage relationship, even if it wasn't that person responsible for the past pains and hurts, those things come out in relationship. And the amazing thing about marriage actually is that as husband and wife, you can take part in the healing process of one another's traumas and hurts. The insecurities you might have had, the issues you might have experienced, even in your childhood, as husband and wife, it is a unique relationship where you can help to mend those 
scars and, and wounds that were experienced years before you might have ever met or gotten married. God is so good. Marriage is a gracious gift of God. It is. Because it pictures Christ and the church. God is the one who designed marriage, and so a healthy marriage is one that's centered on the author of love, which is God himself. He must be at the center. God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman, as we see in Genesis. God created Adam, and everything had always been good, but when he saw Adam alone, he said, it's not good that Adam's alone. So I'm going to make a suitable helper. And that word helper, some people already think is somehow lowering Eve's status. But no, helper is the same word that refers to the Holy Spirit, one of the persons of the triune God. And so he made Adam and Eve both equally valuable in God's image with a purpose to glorify him by loving one another, serving one another and the world around them. Everything down to how a man and a woman, even becoming one flesh, fitting together, was designed by God. And in some mysterious way, this is the interesting thing, profound thing, husband and wife coming together in marriage pictures Christ and the church. And so that means when God was creating Adam and Eve, in his design was the looking forward to what Christ would do upon the cross in bringing the people of God together to be the bride of Christ. It's a unique design. It's a profound thing. A mysterious thing. And then he ends fulfilling it ultimately through Christ Jesus when he comes into the world. Verse 33 again says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. If we do these things as husband and wife, with a heart of love and reverence for God, we will have a healthy marriage. Not perfect, not without conflict, but healthy because God's love and commitment to him and to one another will continue to grow. And so if you find yourselves lacking the love of God in your marriage, be honest about how you're doing spiritually and in your walk with Jesus. Communicate with your spouse. Ask for honesty about ways in which they feel that they have not been receiving love, not been feeling respect, and then work through those things together as you serve one another, not I'm better, I'm better, I'm doing more, I'm doing less, you're doing less, whatever it is, come together and serve one another because God has uniquely designed marriage to be in this way, two people coming together to become one flesh. Lift up your marriage in prayer. Even if you're not married, if you plan on being married at some time, pray for your future spouse. You don't know who that is yet. But pray for them. Pray for that man. Pray for that woman. Saturate your relationship in the love of God. And in the same way, don't demand of one another. Don't use these verses to demand that as husbands that your wives submit or that that as a wife that your husbands love them. Don't use it as weapons to, to... Lower the relationship strength, to weaken the relationship. Instead, take it upon yourself and to see the role that God has given to you as husband or wife and be challenged to love your wife more deeply and in a way that shows the sacrificial love of God. And if, as a wife, to respect and honor and, and submit to your husbands as the word of God says. It's not I do for you and you do for me. It's I love you, my wife, because I know the sacrificial and gracious love of Christ in my life. It's as wives saying to your husband, husband, I will submit to you and honor you and respect you, not because you are so worthy or great, but because God is worthy and great, and he has shown me what submission, perfect submission, looks like. So not perfect but healthy marriages with Christ at the center. Let's live in such a way that every relationship we have will be touched with the amazing love of Christ, but especially as husbands and wives. And next time we'll talk about as parents and children. Let's reflect the love of Christ. Let's pray together. 
Just take a moment to respond. If you're married, praise God for the amazing gift. Now take the word of God, husbands, men. Do you love your wife with the love of Christ? Make a commitment again to God and then to her to say, I'm going to love you with a sacrificial love. I'm not going to be perfect and I'm still prideful at times. I still get defensive at times. I still falter at times. But I am going to make a commitment to love you because Christ has first loved me. If you're not married, men, are you growing in this kind of character in your life? That you're not just looking for someone who's going to give you something, have something to offer you, but you yourself, you're not just looking for the right girl, you are becoming the right man. Because you're growing in your relationship with God. You're learning what it means to humble yourself and know that it's not all about you. Pray right now, make a commitment, say, I want to be a humble man of God, that I'm growing to be the right man who will love my future If you're married, women, wives, have you been submitting to your husbands? It doesn't mean you're doing everything they say, but in your heart, do you respect that man that God has brought into your life? Not because of everything that he's able to do or by his own merit, but because God calls you to it. Because you have seen even how Jesus Christ, the Son of God, submitted to the Father in heaven and went to the cross and died on the cross for the world, for those who believe. Maybe God's challenging you. Maybe your heart's been growing a little more prideful in ways. Maybe God wants you to humble your heart and to submit in different areas of your marriage. It's not easy, especially if you don't feel like your husband deserves it at times. But will you make a commitment that you want to be the wife that God calls you to be? And as the, the husband is loving the wife and, and the wife is, love, is loving and respecting the husband, as both are committing to that, if you're making that commitment right now, it is going to help your marriage. Women who are not married yet but want to be married in the future, Continue to grow in your love for Christ. Know your identity and worth in Him. That He has lavishly loved you to the fullest way that no other person or man will ever be able to satisfy or, or meet that need. So grow in your relationship with Jesus. And pray to God that He would send you a man of God who loves Him. Who you will make a commitment to submit to and respect and honor and prepare yourself as a child of God, as a beautiful daughter of Christ, who will enter into a healthy marriage with someone who knows the Lord, you know the Lord, and so together you can grow in Him and in one another. Just take a moment to pray for that, just one more minute and then I'll, I'll close us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so good. That even you having a relationship with your creation, that is such a, a profound thing. And you give to us so many relationships, unique relationships in our humanity that reflect who you are in your love and in your character. Thank you for marriage. For those of us who are married, thank you, God, for that gift. Help us to not take it for granted. Help us to, as husbands and wives, honor and glorify you in the way that we live and treat one another. That we'd always be looking for ways to serve each other as a husband and wife. And for those who are not yet married, may the principles and the character of God shine through so brightly that every single one of us would have a desire to be more like you in your sacrificial love, in the way that we respect and honor one another. And as a church, may we glorify you as we await the groom, Jesus Christ's return, 
may we be preparing ourselves every day as we grow in our walk with you. Thank you, God, that you show us a map of having a healthy marriage. Thank you that you are the center, you are the compass. You are what drives and motivates each one of us in the people of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.